Hello, welcome back to the Cubane series. We've made it significantly further than I think a lot of people thought we would. Um, here's the whole schematic and, and you know in green is obviously the bits that we've done and we've completed. So we've got this step to do today and it's a bit of a strange step because um, it's when things start looking very very hard on paper. Not so much the, the steps but when you start looking at the structure everything starts looking a little bit messed up. I'm going to explain what we're doing today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what um, is theoretically happening because um, the synthesis part of this step isn't really that interesting. In fact, it's probably the easiest step overall that we've got to do, uh, assuming it works. Um, it's very easy to call something easy when you haven't tried it yet. So what we're doing is we're making this molecule here and, and on its own, independently, this looks stupid. I mean, my chalk drawing really doesn't help it out at all, but even when it's drawn properly, it, it looks really messed up. And it's a bit hard to think, how are we going from this simple molecule to this quite complicated molecule um, in one step? What we're doing is we're actually going via this sort of intermediate here. I'm not sure whether we're actually going via this intermediate, but effectively, for this explanation, we're going <laughs> via this intermediate here. I'm going to talk about how we're going to get from here to here, but just for now, how do we get from here to here? This is the simple bit where we're running it in, in quite basic conditions, um, sodium hydroxide, and we're going to be pulling off bromine. So, you know, we've got a hydrogen here and a bromine here, so we're going to pull that one off, pull that one off, and then put the double bond there. And then the same thing going to happen on this side. So we've got a hydrogen here and a bromine here, and we'll take that hydrogen and bromine off at the same time effectively and then and then put a double one there. So that's how we get from this that one to this one here. But how are we getting from this one to this one here? Well, it's a reaction called a Diels Alder reaction, and it's it's very typical of a university chemistry course to go quite in depth into the Diels Alder reaction. And I think it's taught a lot. Well, I, I don't know why things are taught at university because there's so much to teach, but why you spend so much time on the Diels Alder reaction? Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's it's an industrially significant reaction, but I, I think one of the reasons you start learning about it is that it gets you to think about molecules reacting more than just two dimensionally. You're used to seeing molecules like this written sort of in a 2D plane and you think they sort of react as if they lived in sort of flat land and things sort of react just in two dimensions but they don't and what you have here with these these double bonds and where the electrons are is more than just in the two dimensions so these double bonds what's actually happening is that a lot of that electron density where the actual electrons are where the bonds are they come out of the page so they're there in this z direction so if this is x and this is y they're off there in the z direction so they are, you know, above and below. So what's actually happening when these two molecules react with each other, one of them is coming on top of the other one and they're reacting. Okay, so we've got two of our intermediates here and you've got to imagine that this one is coming on top of this one. Uh, I, I can't draw that, but you have to imagine that this one in 3D space is coming on top of this one. And what's happening is that this carbon here is this, so this double bond is going to flick out. Well, I mean, it's not how it works, but you can imagine that and then react with that. So this is, this is going down, so this one's underneath and this one's on top. And then this one will go, this double bond will go here, like that, that'll rotate around, so it'll like that, and then like this. And then this double bond will come all the way down to that one there. So you see how that, that kind of works? <laughs> so that's how we end up with, with it like this, right? Like that one there. So we've got this thing here and then the bond between this one. So we've like, you know, moved, a bonds round in a circle. Well, it's a circle three-dimensionally. <laughs> so we've shifted all the bonds around, so that's how we end up with with this kind of complex molecule is we, we get two of them and we form this, this ring. So that's a Diels outer reaction. Very favorable, it's quite fast, if we get the right conditions. So really the conditions are all about pulling off those bromines, because once we pulled off those bromines, these two molecules react together quite fast in, in, in a good yield. And the interesting thing is also is there's, there's sort of two ways that they can react, because it's coming on top here, you can imagine that this molecule could also react sort of the other way and then the bromine would be on the other side. It's it's pretty hard to visualize and quite hard to draw, but um, there's sort of two ways a deals outer can go. There's an endo product and an exo product, that's what they're called. Don't ask me to tell you <laughs> how they're named. Um, I have learned that at some point, but I would need to break out the chemistry textbook <laughs> um, to be able to tell you um, endo versus exo these days. But the good news is, is um, this product here we know is an endo product. We just know that from the paper. And there's no mention of the exo product. So we're forming the endo product at 100%. That's the other interesting thing about the Diels Older reaction and why you learn it is because that ratio of endo to exo and when the product's going to be the exo form and when the product's going to be the endo form and what drives that is really interesting and you, and you need to learn. Well, I'm not sure about interesting, but there's a lot of science there. And really you think, well, if this goes around the other way, then that bromine is gonna be awkwardly there. 
there or here or something like that and that clash means that it's not as favorable and because that form is not as favorable is that what making the endo form be 100 percent or is it just because this you know happens a lot faster and it happens before any exo one can form so there's a lot of depth to the deals out or reaction and it teaches you a lot of stuff about fucking chemistry the good news about this reaction is that we no longer have to worry about anhydrous conditions. Apparently, you get a slightly better yield if you use anhydrous conditions, such as I think initially people were talking about using uh, tertiary butanol and um, potassium tert butoxide. But the 1989 paper found that the yields were just as good if you used just sodium hydroxide and ethanol or methanol. And then the uh, 1997 paper follows it up with um, using sodium hydroxide in methanol. We're going back to our roots here with hardware store ingredients. It's just uh, ethanol from the hardware store. It's 95% ethanol with some denatrant in it. Uh, it's called methylated spirits. Doesn't actually have any methanol in it. Uh, sodium hydroxide is a big container of sodium hydroxide. And we're just going to use both of these like without further purification, just straight from the hardware store shelf. <laughs> so yeah, back to fast and loose. Not worrying about drying anything out or uh, uh, redistilling stuff. It's just fast and loose and see, we'll see how we go. I'm not going to use all our tribromide up, maybe like a third of it or so, so that if this fast and loose method doesn't work, then we don't lose all our product, but um, we'll see what kind of yields we can get. yellow and I haven't even added the yellow stuff yet. It's just the sodium hydroxide and the ethanol. <laughs> it gets on this weird coloration. I've seen this before from it when they're adding sodium to ethanol, you know, this sort of grade of ethanol. So there's there's something a little bit weird in it, but um, I don't think it'll harm it too much. It doesn't look very pretty when it's this horrible coloration already. Ah, oh well. Got the condenser on, I gotta hook up the water and add the rest of this solid. Well, add any of it because I haven't had it I haven't added any of it yet, even though it looks like I have. And I will say, I'm generally pretty relaxed about greasing joints. I, I tend not to do it as much as like the rest of the world tends to do it. But for reaction mixtures like this, where we've got sodium hydroxide in ethanol, that mixture can sort of etch glass ever so slightly, especially while hot. It's not going to damage the flask really, but if it can get in the joint here and then heated, because it's a ground glass joint, it's got a lot of surface area between two things, it, it can very easily fuse. The two together when dealing with very basic stuff yeah you, you've got to really worry about your joints and i don't want this condenser stuck to this flask forever you know because uh it's one thing to have them stuck but it's another thing to have them really cease and actually like fuse together by the sodium hydroxide because then you can never get them apart um so i've got this brand new bloody grease uh, this is some very expensive stuff. This is like the proper fluorinated stuff and it's a whole lot of it. So this is <laughs> probably the most expensive lube you'll ever see. Actually, well, I don't know. I don't know what kind of lube you're buying. You can probably get very expensive lube that's got fucking gold flakes that are ribbed for a pleasure or something in it. But this is expensive lube. <laughs> this came from the US from Brian who um, DM'd me on Twitter and thanks for it. Um, he, he didn't buy this. He actually saved it from the bin. His company were throwing it out because they used a small amount and then decided that they didn't need the rest of it. So they... <laughs> put it in the bin so he thought I could use it to actually grease some joints so um, with this much I can probably grease 8,000 joints three hours on the reflux there and uh, there's there's precipitate at the bottom you can kind of see that spun around yeah yeah, yeah. so hopefully that's our sodium bromide that's precipitating out because that's that sodium hydroxide pulls off the bromides on the organic molecule it'll form sodium bromide which isn't soluble in the ethanol and that's a good sign what we're going to do is we're going to dump it out in a whole lot of cold water uh, like 500 mils or so so it's quite a lot of, of stuff and that'll dissolve the bromide 
but precipitate out uh, products and then, and then we can filter that off. So at the moment, you know, the precipitate is the thing that we don't want. <laughs> Everything that we want is dissolved. So we'll be swapping that around by just dumping it out in a whole lot of water. Uh, it's not a great color, <laughs> um, but we'll see how we go. It never is the bloody right color. <laughs> Here we are the next day. This is a bit of a glassware graveyard at the moment. <laughs> yeah, from this experiment, the last one, been churning through the glassware, but I'll um, clean it up in a second, I swear. Let's have a look at our product. It looks really good. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's brown and you know, that's not great, but this looks exactly like I was expecting it to. Even really the brown color, I was, I was thinking it was, you know, gonna come out of this color. It's not really tar, but it's not like crystalline or anything. And it looks very different than our, than our product started out being. This is a lot less dense. It's more like clay or mud. That's excellent. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna recrystallize it from some hot ethanol. This has been heating up. I'll just get that back heating again. Make it recrystallize into a bit more of a, a white color or something we could call beige potentially rather than just brown, which this is brown. I'm not gonna pretend and call this beige. I mean, if I was publishing a paper, I'd call this off-white. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not that mean. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's just an off-white product. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get this recrystallizing. Here's our final product. It's only uh, 0.6 grams, which corresponds to a, a percentage yield of uh, 18% <laughs> based on our starting reagents. I'm fairly sure all of that has been from the recrist. We've got a lot still in this ethanol, um, and I, I filtered some out. I, I, I think there's some potassium bromide in there, but we lost quite a bit of solvent that way. But it's all right. I'll be running the synthesis again, and I'll just reuse this solvent, if that makes sense, for the recrist next time. So uh, we haven't really lost anything here. I'll just carry the yield forward that we lost this time into the reaction next time. I don't think that's a really a thing people do, but that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Point being is that we got this, and it's looking pretty nice. I mean, it's not brown. I wouldn't call it brown. It's not very nice to call a solid a brown solid when you're looking for something colorless as per the author's got a colors product. But I'd go so far as to say this is tan. A light tan powder, maybe not light tan, just tan. In terms of confirming uh, what it is, we can do the world's crudest melting point test. We know our, our product we started with has a melting point of about 78. And this, if it is our product, should have a melting point of about 170 odd. And then if it's all just sodium bromide, which is our other byproduct from the action, it'll have a melting point of about 782. So I'm just going to heat it with, with, with a bit of a, a light flame. And if it melts, um, you know, that's roughly in our right range because that sort of flame temp should melt something about 200 pretty easily. But um, not so easily that, you know, we see that it's an 80 degree melting point thing. But um, if it's just sodium bromide, it won't melt at all. But yes, like I said, world's cruise melting point test. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to get too confident, but... Holy shit, we, we might actually be doing this. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. I'll uh, see you in the next video.